Welcome to our soil testing video series, jointly presented by the Geotechnical Division of the HKIE and the Geotechnical Engineering Office of the CEDD. The production of this series is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. In this video, we will focus on the most common soil test we encounter in geotechnical engineering, the triaxial test. This video discusses the principles, equipment, and test procedures of a triaxial test. Interpretation of test results will be covered in video 8b. Unlike typical construction materials such as concrete and steel, the strength of a soil is largely governed by the shear strength. Shear strength of a soil is required in most geotechnical designs. In particular, to solve problems of stability, such as slope, retaining wall and foundation stability. The shear strength of a soil depends on the failure criterion we adopt. The Moore Coulomb failure criterion is one of the most common failure criteria from which we can obtain the shear strength parameters of a soil. Please refer to our video on the shear box test for more discussions on this. Geospectry gives detailed procedures for four types of tests that make use of the triaxial apparatus. The three routine triaxial tests for soil shear strength determination included in Geospec 3 are the unconsolidated undrained test, UU test, the consolidated undrained test, CU test, and the consolidated drain test, CD test. This video will cover these three triaxial tests commonly used in Hong Kong. Before starting a triaxial test, we have to prepare a soil specimen a triaxial soil specimen can be prepared from a class 1 undisturbed sample, such as a mazier sample, piston sample, or a block sample obtained from ground investigation. It can also be prepared from disturbed samples, such as recompacted or remolded samples. Disturbed samples are commonly used in testing fill materials for reclamation, fill slopes, retaining wall backfill, etc. This is a general view of a triaxial test setup in the laboratory. This shows you a closer view of the triaxial cell. This chart summarizes the essential details regarding routine triaxial tests using the conventional triaxial apparatus. As mentioned earlier, there are three types of routine triaxial tests, namely the UU, CU, and CD test. For the CU test, there are two options, either a single stage or a multi-stage test. More discussions on this can be found in video 8b. The four standard steps in a routine triaxial test are specimen preparation, saturation of the soil specimen, consolidation of the specimen, and finally, shearing. We will show you details of these four steps later. Four types of measurements may be taken during a triaxial test. We will now explain them one by one. The first is axial stress measurement. The axial force applied to the soil specimen during shearing is provided by a motor underneath the triaxial cell which pushes the cell upwards. The bottom of the specimen moves upwards with the cell. However, the top of the specimen remains almost stationary due to a piston connected to a stiff crossbar through a proofing ring. This causes compression or shearing of the soil specimen. The axial load applied to the soil is measured by the proofing ring. As the cross-sectional area of the specimen is known, the axial stress can be calculated. This axial stress is the major principal stress in the test. The second measurement is the axial strain measurement. The axial deformation of the soil specimen during shearing is measured by a digimatic gauge set up on top of the triaxial cell and fixed to the piston. When an axial force is applied through the motor, the triaxial cell moves upwards and pushes the plunger of the digimatic gauge to measure the upward movement. The magnitude of the upward movement of the cell is assumed to be equal to the axial deformation of the specimen 
As the height of the specimen is known, the axial strain can be calculated. The third measurement is pressure measurement. There are three types of pressure to be measured, namely cell pressure, back pressure and pore water pressure. These are measured by means of pressure transducers. This is the cell pressure line which serves to fill up the triaxial cell with water and provide an all-round water pressure acting on the specimen. This is the back pressure line which feeds water and then applies pressure to the pore water to facilitate saturation of the specimen during the saturation stage. During the consolidation and drain shearing stages, this back pressure line allows water to move into and out of the specimen. This is the pore pressure line which measures the pore water pressure in the specimen. After the specimen is saturated, ideally, the three pressures are the same. In practice, cell pressure CP is purposely adjusted to be about 5 kPa larger than the back pressure BP. During the consolidation and shearing stages, the so-called confining pressure is equal to CP minus BP, but treating BP as a datum. The confining pressure is the minor principal stress in the test. The fourth measurement is volume change measurement of the specimen. During consolidation and drain shearing stages, we need to measure the volume change of the soil under the applied stress. An important assumption in this measurement is that the soil is fully saturated, such that any change in soil volume is represented by the volume change of the water in the soil. The volume change is measured through the back pressure line by an equipment known as the Volume Change Apparatus, VCA. Using this, the volumetric strain of the specimen can be calculated. With a basic understanding of the key equipment and measuring systems in a triaxial test, let us walk you through the typical procedures of a routine triaxial test. The four standard stages shown here apply to all three types of routine triaxial tests, except that saturation and consolidation are not required for the UU test. First and foremost, to prepare an undisturbed specimen, the soil is extruded from a sample such as a mazier or a block sample obtained from ground investigation. For a mazier sample, we first saw cut a suitable portion of the sample from the tube. Then, we contain a suitable size of the sample within a split mold and cut off any surplus soil to make flat the ends of the specimen. For a block sample, we first cut out an approximately rectangular prism of soil, slightly larger than the dimensions of the specimen. We further trim it to a suitable size and then contain it within a split mold with the help of a clamp. We finally trim the ends of a specimen flat. For a disturbed specimen prepared from either remolding or compaction, the designer has to specify the dry density and moisture content of the soil. The soil is then mixed with water to the desired moisture content and stored for at least 12 hours in a properly sealed bag. The soil is then compacted into a split mold or remolded to the required density using a calculated mass of soil. We now put a filter paper and a saturated porous disc onto both the top and the bottom of the specimen. One to two rubber membranes are then used to wrap around the specimen to prevent it from direct contact with the cell water. We then transfer the specimen onto the triaxial base pedestal. O-rings are used to secure the rubber membrane onto the base pedestal and top cap. Finally, we assemble the cell body with the loading piston and fill the triaxial cell with de-aired water. Now, we may proceed to the second stage, that is to feed water into the specimen and saturate it by means of increasing the back pressure. The principle of using back pressure is to reduce the air voids within the soil by two physical processes. First, reduce the air volume through boiled soil. Second, dissolve the air into solution by increasing the air solubility through Henry's law. When we increase the back pressure to saturate the soil, we must at the same time increase the cell pressure surrounding the soil to prevent bursting of the specimen. How do we know the specimen is saturated or nearly saturated? Well, we make use of the pore pressure coefficient B, 
which is defined as the change in pore water pressure divided by an increase in cell pressure. Except for very loose or soft soils, when the B value is greater than or equal to 0.95 and the back pressure is greater than or equal to 200 kPa, we consider the soil specimen to be practically saturated. Once the soil has been saturated, except for the UU test, isotropic consolidation may be carried out. The consolidation is done by increasing the cell pressure CP. This increase in external load is taken up by water in the specimen and gives rise to an excess pore water pressure. With the back pressure line open, the excess pore water pressure is gradually dissipated through this drainage line. The consolidation process continues until the excess pore water pressure is completely dissipated. Hence, at the very end of the consolidation stage, the pore water pressure reverts back to the back pressure, BP, again. The difference between CP and BP is referred to as the confining pressure. The consolidation stage also provides useful information for estimating the rate of axial displacement required in the subsequent shearing stage. After the consolidation stage, shearing is carried out under the specified confining pressure with the back pressure line either closed or open, depending on the drainage conditions specified. We have already explained earlier how the axial stress is measured during shearing. In fact, due to the all-round cell pressure, the measured axial stress is the deviator stress as shown here. Under drain conditions, where the drainage line is kept open and drainage is allowed, any excess pore water pressure developed during the loading of the specimen would dissipate, leading to a volume change. Under undrained conditions, however, the drainage line is kept closed and drainage is not allowed, resulting in the buildup of excess pore water pressure during loading of the specimen with no volume change. This table here summarizes the graphs plotted in the shearing stage of conventional triaxial tests, including the stress paths in terms of ST and PQ plots for the shearing stage. These plots are typically included in the test reports for subsequent use in the test result interpretation. Shearing is typically stopped at an axial strain of 20% except under the first and second stages of a multi-stage consolidated undrained CU test. During the first and second stages of a multi-stage CU test, shearing is stopped when either a peak deviator stress or a peak stress ratio is reached. Finally, after shearing, the axial force is removed, the cell pressure is reduced to zero, and the water is drained from the cell. The cell is then dismantled and we remove the rubber membrane, top cap, porous disc and the specimen from the base pedestal. We then sketch the failure mode of the specimen. The wet mass of the specimen is then weighed along with taking photographs before drying the soil in an oven to obtain its dry mass to estimate the moisture content of the specimen. This wraps up our video on the triaxial test. We hope you have gained valuable insights on the principles, equipment, and test procedures. Interpretation of triaxial test results will be discussed in video 8B. Thank you for watching.